Atlas Fallen may be one of the most complicated games I've ever reviewed. The game has some pretty cool combat, interesting story beats, and fun RPG elements which again lead back to the combat. I wouldn't consider this a AAA game, but it's definitely not indie. At $50, it doesn't seem like too much of a risk compared to some of the full price $70 games we've gotten this year. I don't know what you were expecting and barely know what I was expecting, but I can say that this is a game and as such, we are going to talk about it. Hello world and all who inhabit it, it is I the great- What? Oh this? Oh yeah, well I moved so I had to take down the background and I'm in this new place and I don't really have a setup just yet, but don't pay attention to that for now. Hello world and all who inhabit it, it is I the great Seiran and Atlas Fallen actually surprised me with how fun and frustrating this game can be. It was announced at Gamescom in 2022 and I immediately was interested based on the initial trailer. I reached out to Focus Entertainment about this game and they provided me with a Steam review code, but that's the extent of their involvement with this review process. Here at Sayran Gaming, we talk honestly about games so that you and your wallet are protected. This isn't a full price game and at 10 to 15 hours for the main story, it's not a massive time sink, but I still want to talk to you about Atlas Fallen and what you can expect from this game. I feel like there wasn't much to go off of with Atlas Fallen and even at cons like PAX East when I was able to see gameplay live in front of me, I was still not exactly sure what was going on aside from the really cool combat. Combat that I really enjoy but also have issues with. There is a story that we'll touch on later, but for now, let's focus on the specs of my PC. I usually don't review games on PC, so if I miss something, please ask in the comments because I'm very responsive. I'm rocking an RTX 3060 with a Ryzen 5 3600G. Using the recommended settings the game gave me off first boot, I was able to get anywhere from 50 frames on the low end to 80 frames on the upper end and was able to keep that to a mostly stable high 50, which for a game like this is totally fine. There were some frame drops in certain areas, but with a few tweaks, I probably could have gotten rid of that. I had this game running at 1080p at high settings. Basically, performance never got in the way of my experience, though it wasn't perfect. Rarely did I stop and think about frame rate or anything, and if I wasn't doing this review, I could have easily finished this game with even less thoughts about it. Again, it was not perfect, but for this game, I'm willing to not dock as many points for performance, and I'm sure with an inevitable day one patch, it'll be even better, so don't worry about that too much if that's a concern right now. Games in 2023 have had some pretty wicked PC launches, so I'm taking whatever wins we can get. This is a game I prefer a higher frame rate with, but it doesn't need to be triple digits. Around 60 is totally fine. This isn't the prettiest game, and when using my really cool traversal skills, there is considerable pop in, but if you're not looking for it, I don't expect it to ruin your experience. But if you're the keen eyed pixel peeping type, then you might be disappointed. They already addressed this when they gave me my review code, so be on the lookout for a patch for that. The game isn't a graphical powerhouse, so I wasn't expecting to be blown away visually, which means if my experience didn't hold up, I wasn't going to be upset. I wanted to be pleasantly surprised. Here, but wasn't. I had lower expectations, so again, I wasn't disappointed, but there's just nothing notable to say for or against this aspect of the game. Where I was pleasantly surprised though was the combat. Honestly, I hated the combat initially. The attacks felt weird, like the animations were way too long for what I was doing. Swinging that sand axe was more than two seconds long with an awkward hold and pause at the end. It seemed like missing an attack would leave me wide open to a huge punish as if I was playing Street Fighter 6 or something. Be sure to check out my review of that game. I was very annoyed until I realized that's really not how the combat would be in practice. I mean yes, missing an attack would leave me open, but usually the attacks honed in on the proper target. Mostly. There are some weird hitbox issues that pissed me off. It works both ways, where you can press one of your two main attack buttons and usually magnetically cling to your target and get your combo off, but also they can hit you from what feels like unfair angles. I had this super long boss fight that took an hour because of these persistent hitbox issues. I feel like if this was tightened up just a bit, then that would have taken me a few tries versus 10. For instance, I was in the air doing a combo on this crab monster's head and this ground enemy charged me with an attack like a bull or something. Somehow it hit me even though I was like 10 feet away. I don't know how the game reads these hits, but I had to basically dodge and parry everything because I wasn't sure what would actually hit me and it made the fight take way longer than it should because there were multiple enemies I had to be considerate of as I fought off this pretty difficult boss. Combat is pretty cool, you have a main weapon and a secondary. As you progress through the game you unlock more, but you start off with an axe and a whip. You can alternate between these in fights for different combos and also hold your attack button for more powerful attacks that change the shape of your weapons. You will sand, so this whole game feels like you're earthbending. 
As you wail on enemies, you build momentum, which is a pretty cool concept. The higher your momentum, the more abilities and in battle perks you unlock, but also the more damage you take. It's a double edged sword that brings this really cool resource management aspect into the combat. It's beyond button mashing and getting combos. It's about creating a loadout with different weapons and abilities that activate as you get more momentum, but also weighing the risk of maxing out momentum for potentially getting one shot because you'll be at max vulnerability. You'll have all your passive abilities and magic at your disposal, but one punch to the face could end you. I really like it. It's the kind of combat I'd expect the traditional RPG franchise to implement like Final Fantasy 16. I think it would have been really cool with this combat system and made it a bit more unique than what it was. Not that the combat was bad, but I talked about all that in my video review of that game. Another cool aspect of this game is the parrying. If you can time it right, you can freeze enemies in place by crystallizing them. With bosses, you usually have to get three near perfect parries in succession to crystallize them, but for smaller enemy rates, once is good enough. The game does give you a visual cue of when all enemies attack. Red indicators are the primary primary attacks and the ones you want to parry, but the blue are unblockable and drain health and momentum. These can be pretty annoying, so dodge these as best as you can, unless the hitboxes somehow catch you. The parry can be whiffed as well. It's not Souls-like levels of perfect timing, but pressing too early or too late will leave you vulnerable. There's a pretty good window if you do it early, but there's no saving you on a late parry. There's also a slight cooldown when you use it and miss it. That cooldown is just long enough to make your parry unusable before the next enemy attack. Using it and parrying properly eliminates the cooldown so you can use it back to back. There were some times where I feel like I parried properly, but I still got hit, and also times where I feel like the game may have been a bit too lenient on my parry. Again, I don't want souls like levels of parrying, but a bit more consistency would be great. It's predictable enough though. There may be a few WTF moments in there, but there will be plenty of awesome moments like when I parried a boss attack and then immediately parried a small charging race attack back to back with the boss's next attack. The combat comes together quite well ground and air dodges are icing on the cake. I love a game where I can be all over the battlefield and this game's enemies definitely take advantage of the space given. They'll cover the entire field in explosions, tornadoes, and sweeping attacks if you let them. Again, the combat is really fun and as you tailor your perks, passives, and abilities to your liking, you'll begin to enjoy it more and more. It's the strongest aspect of this game for me. The game's story is pretty easy to follow. You start as a slave. You're unnamed because slaves in this world don't even have the rights to an actual name. Their name is whatever they do, like tracker or blacksmith. You're one of these unnamed and on a trip gone wrong, you get attacked by wraiths, the monsters of this world. They're deadly and after getting holed up at a camp, you venture out and find this gauntlet that gives you your sand bending abilities. From there, your goal is to dismantle the oppressive forces that hold you back, but of course that devolves into a broader, larger goal involving, you guessed it, gods. Literal gods because it wouldn't be an RPG if you didn't have to fight God for some reason. After that, the game's story is pretty much told through context and gameplay, which is fine by me. Cutscenes are half-baked and awkwardly cut, but I'm not sure if that's just a review copy problem or if that would be present in the final build. I personally don't think you have to pay that much attention to the story. It's cool, but it doesn't do anything new. I'm not attached to any of these characters and with how minimally present cutscenes are and how short they're shown, I don't think they cared about this aspect much. Fine by me. The story is instead told by NPCs, side quests, and dialogue, hey, while doing literally anything else. It's not a bad approach, but it can feel a bit cheap, but again, I don't think they care. This world is set in a few different open zones. The maps aren't connected in a traditional sense, but you'll be able to travel in between zones whenever you like. One of the marks of a good open world is if I can get distracted by something cool looking on the way to do something actually marked on my map. That happened a few times. As a sandbender, you're able to unearth the greenish, bluish, glowy spots on the ground that can trigger a chain of events like completing a seal or finding a treasure. The different things you can do aren't that varied. It's not not like Tears of the Kingdom where you can easily get lost, but it's more interactive than, say, Forspoken. There are pretty cool points of interest, things to hop on, things to open, and plenty of things to beat up. The traversal is pretty cool too. You can surf the sand, and the physics engine here can give you some pretty wicked speeds if you start at a good enough angle. You can collect different items in the overworld to craft more abilities for combat or upgrade your armor or other skills. Side note, you can change the color of your armor and create some pretty nice looks. I stuck with a black aesthetic with some highlights. As you go around the map, you'll find different interactable spots that can really bring this world to life. It's not a perfect open world zone thing, but it does a pretty good job of trying to be and stay interesting even if it falls short because of the lack of variety. The speed at which you can zoom around the world also helps when you want to ignore all that stuff and just get to the next objective as well. There can be a bit of fetch questing in this game, but contextually it makes sense that they'd want you to explore the world this way. There are rewards, items, and progression behind exploration even if it's not directly stated. Atlas Fallen is a game that falls victim to your expectations. If they're high, then you may be disappointed. If you go 
go in with an open mind and understanding that this game isn't perfect, then you'll find fun with hours of play. From a double A $50 perspective, I think this game is a recommend for the open minded and a wait and see for those who have a bit higher standards of how they spend their money. It's a tough time to be a slightly better than okay game. We have some bangers coming up here soon and it's about to get crucial for gamers and our wallets. Be sure to check out my review of Final Fantasy 16 and for more gaming news and reviews, also be sure to like, comment, subscribe, all the good stuff and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.